the most exciting hour in the most exciting of trials. The fiery prosecutor accuses relentlessly while Hauptmann's wife listens. You conceal the truth, he shouts. Welcome to the NJ Criminal Podcast and part two in this series. Yeah, and, and the thing that's obviously concerning and, the, and one of the things that I, reasons why I wanted to focus on this is because obviously everyone is presumed innocent um, until proven guilty and uh, certainly the death penalty, which no longer exists in New Jersey, is the ultimate punishment. And, and to think that someone was you know, possibly wrongly convicted uh, and executed for it is certainly disturbing uh, to everyone. Let me tell you, yeah, let me mention something that you might appreciate. Um, kidnapping was not um, uh, subject to the death penalty in uh, New Jersey in the 1930s, um, but burglary was. Um, so an accidental death in the course of a burglary could result in execution. That was the theory that the police, that the prosecution started with, um, is is that the death was accidental during this um, burglary. Uh, and the burglary that they came up with was the sleeping suit the child was wearing, which is not worth very much money. And they made the claim that at common law, uh, it could still be a felony. And that was a big issue for the defense. Um, so the question was whether taking a sleeping suit was a felony in the first place and then the accidental death resulting in execution. So that was the theory it was tried on until the closing argument. Um, but in fact, the police already knew that the sleeping suit wasn't even taken permanently. They received, a Condon received the sleeping suit back in the mail as proof that the child was being held by a gang of um, uh, kidnappers, uh, which was the theory that Lindbergh had pushed from the very start until Houtman's arrest. After that, it became a lone wolf. Um, but the sleeping suit came back, so it wasn't even a per permanent taking. Um, but that was a very, a very slim read on which they got the death penalty. The other reason they were able to pursue the case as they did was the um, Dr. Uh, Mitchell, who was the medical examiner, was convinced to commit perjury. Um, he had um, been very clear um, in previous testimony uh, that the death couldn't have resulted from a fall from the um, second story. Um, but he was uh, coached to say that the child died instantly um, that um, at the farmhouse. Um, and th at that point, the only theory was that he'd been dropped from the second story um, in the burlap bag. He said that it wasn't true, but the reason they asked him to do that is because if the child didn't die at the farmhouse, this whole trial was in the wrong county. And that was an issue that was being raised because if the child died where he was found at the, in these woods, it was another county. Interesting. And it would have been, it would have been the county where Trenton uh, was located and, um, the capital and the um, jury pool would have been far different and maybe more favorable to the defense, much more because in, in uh, this rural county where Lindbergh lived, um, everybody worshipped him. Most people did. Right. And the kidnapping, uh, you know, the case eventually did lead to the creation of uh, what was commonly known as the Lindbergh Law, making kidnapping across state lines a federal crime. But you bring up a good point. Uh, the the question becomes, okay, even if Haltman did it, uh, was the death penalty the appropriate punishment? Right, and the problem is that the two theories that were posed by Lentz as the prosecutor um, were both um, unsupported by evidence that the Lentz had in hand. He knew there was no blood found anywhere. There was no way you could have a largely bloodless, mostly skeletal corpse in the woods with no blood ever found by a high-end lab in the burlap bag that supposedly transported him on any of the child's clothing, um, on the crib, um, on the ground outside Lindbergh's house. They knew that. He couldn't have died at either location on the night of March 1, and that's the only theories that were prosecuted against Houtman. Do you think this was simply a situation where the uh, police failed to maintain control over their own investigation due to the fact that they were dealing with a a, a, a 
well-known, popular, famous figure, Charles Lindbergh Sr.? Well, absolutely. But the original investigation, the very first day, um, the uh, Hopewell police chief wasn't um, cowed, and he thought it was an inside job, um, and he was immediately taken off the case. It was the state police who, uh, in fact, the head of the state police uh, um, worshipped um, Lindbergh and said that he would even lie for him in a later magazine um, interview. Um, he, there wasn't anything he wouldn't do for Lindbergh. Where is all of the uh, existing evidence maintained for this case? Well, there isn't much existing evidence because there was an issue raised about what DNA might, uh, testing might show um, around the turn of this century. And uh, the state police offered back the original T-shirts and uh, some other evidence that was um, touched by or um, related to the corpse, like there were, they had some foot and hand bones that um, had been disconnected um, when they were found on site, so they weren't cremated. Um, and in any event, they handed those back to the Lindbergh family, um, and so they couldn't be tested. Um, so there is a little bit um, that's left. That included the thumb guard, I think, was uh, given back. But uh, what's in their museum, some of it is replacement items that look like what, um, what, what they were, like the thumb guard, but isn't the original one. Um, the wood is still the same. Uh, the wooden ladder is still there. And the, uh, the plank from the attic is still there. And there are, I think there are envelopes and stamps that could be analyzed for DNA evidence also that are still there. This occurred uh, just over 90 years ago, if my math is correct. Right. Um, I'm assuming that there is uh, no one uh, who would have been uh, alive and potentially a witness to either any of the incidents or uh, the trial uh, still alive uh, to be able to, to speak with. Absolutely and, true. But there was a fellow, Ben Lupica, who was a teenager at the time. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned him in the neighbor. book. Yep, you mentioned him in the book. I was trying to look to see if he was still alive or not. No, no. He was in his 80s when he was interviewed uh, 30 years ago, I think. Um, but in any event, um, the police, um, my, mysteriously, really, for, he never understood why, dropped um, the inquiry that they were making on his... Um, a suggestion because he had been driving home from high school um, the night of March 1 around 6 p.m. and um, he saw another car um, by the Lindbergh's uh, at the entrance to the Lindbergh's driveway um, and he recognized the car it was a um, he didn't know that particular car but he recognized it as a 1929 Dodge he rec and he he noticed that it had um, spoke wheels, wooden spoke wheels, and he noticed some other details about it um, because he was interested in cars as a teenager. Um, and there was a fellow driving it who was slim and had a city feller's uh, coat on, meaning a, a, a long coat, I think, uh, um, and winter coat. And a fedora, and the fedora um, partly hit his face, and it was dusk, so he couldn't recognize the face. He hadn't seen it before. Um, but he did notice that the, that the man was acting rather strangely and had a ladder, um, a, a sectional ladder draped over the passenger seat. Um, so when he heard the next day that there had been a kidnapping at the Lindbergh, he went to the police and uh, he saw the ladder that had been found in the yard and said, yes, that looks like the one I saw. And the police said, well, let's go. One of the main things he said is that he noticed it had local plates like his own license plates, New Jersey plates. And so the police said that they wanted to pick him up from school, which they did, and go look for owners um, in that county of um, 1929 blue or black um, sedan, he wasn't sure which, four-door, um, that he might recognize. And they started looking, couldn't find it um, when they were partway through the list, and then they dropped the whole thing um, at the point, right around the point at which Lindbergh was placed in total charge of the investigation. Um, the FBI later interviewed Lupica, um, and he gave a similar account. But 
by the time of trial, um, they the prosecution was not happy that Lupica said, no, that is not Houtman's car um, that I saw, which is a different year and had uh, wire spokes. And also Houtman's car uh, originally when the police um, confiscated it had a very large um, hand built uh, wooden trunk on the back that Houtman said he put there um, permanently because he, it, was using it for a tent and other equipment to drive across country to visit his sister in California in, I think it was 1930 or 31. Um, in any event, the police removed that before trial. Um, but um, what Lupica saw was a tire on the back, um, a spare tire on the back of the car that he, that he saw that night. And Houtman's spare tire, because he built this trunk, was actually... Um, by the driver's side of his car. So there were very big differences between them, and nobody followed up with it. And what, um, what Lupica got disgusted because he was offered a ransom, he was offered money by the state uh, to testify that it was Houtman's car. He refused and became a witness for the defense. Who offered him money to testify falsely? The, well, the state did because the state had $25,000, I think, in. Um, uh, reward money, mm -hmm. and so it was being parceled out to those that supported their case. Wow, I, I, I'm fairly certain you can't do that today. <laughs> right, I would think not, but the, but the other witnesses, he, um, Lupica said that the three men who did testify for the state, that they saw someone who resembled um, Houtman essentially casing the area uh, up to, um, the, they were, didn't see him at the estate on, the, on, on March 1 taking the child, but in the days leading up to it, they saw him, they said, uh, they each got money. Um, and one of them was an elderly man that the governor, uh, new governor, later interviewed. The fellow was almost blind. And what he described to the police was a green two-door uh, car, coupe, um, which didn't make any sense. And he said he saw it the morning of March 1 when the police knew, this, um, this actually New York police knew and probably had told the New Jersey police that they'd verified that Houtman was in uh, New York City then. What do you think is the most important lead or leads that should have been followed up on by the police uh, but were not? Well, Lupica was, was a huge one because mm -hmm. if they had, um, there couldn't have been that many um, uh, cars of that description registered in the county um, from 19, you know, 1929 Dodge. Um, and if they'd followed that up, they would have found who owned it. Um, and that would have been a big clue. Another thing that was not followed up on at all was Lindbergh had a private line in his study, and Lindbergh had either called, I don't know which line he called on, but the, he might have called on the other line um, to say he was going to be late coming home that night. Um, nobody ever checked on where he called from. He couldn't have called from New York City where he would started out because the call was um, too close to the time he arrived. Um, if they'd found out where he really was, then that would have been a big clue. I wonder if they had no the ability to do that. Him. Yeah, I wonder if they had Excuse the. Me? I wonder if they had the ability uh, with oh, their they technology. Did. They, they mm -hmm. checked. They did have the ability. They had an operator on most calls. Uh, if mm -hmm. there was a, if it was a uh, the the regular landline that was uh, in the hall between the kitchen, uh, like a little uh, uh, niche between the kitchen and the living room, I think, um, then the operator was involved on all those calls. Did the uh, police ever follow up on the individual that Houtman said he received that box from that ultimately contained the ransom money in it? He died. Isidore mm. Fish died in, in March of 34. So, uh. But what's interesting, the police knew that when he was dying, he had something he wanted to tell Houtman, and nobody ever figured out what that was. Interesting. And I guess there was no uh, links that were ever established between Fish and anyone else involved in well, these. Actually, there were. Actually, mm -hmm. there were. That's one of the other problems with the case. Um, at trial, um, Houtman, of course, is, his defense was saying that um, he got this box from, uh, from Fish. He didn't know what was in it, all of that. And the state uh, um, made sure to... Um, 
question all of that and say that there was no evidence that Fish was involved in anything. Okay, the problem with that is that they were uh, they had evidence to the contrary. There was a night watchman at one at the St. Raymond Cemetery who who said that he before trial that he had recognized a picture of Fish as someone who was standing guard for Cemetery John, um, or somebody who looked suspicious um, that night when that transaction occurred. Um, the guard hadn't seen the transaction, but he had seen this fellow. Uh, then there was an, another watchman at uh, uh, near Hopewell uh, Railroad Station um, in Skillman Village who picked out Fish's picture uh, as someone that he saw that was suspicious. Um, and then a third fellow, uh, the one who testified that um, Hauptman was seen skulking around the area, had actually described someone um, earlier to the police in a statement that looked like fish. Fish was smaller, much smaller. Interesting. What do you, what do you think? Do you think that um, this is just a situation where the uh, prosecution, and look, a prosecutor is supposed to achieve justice, not just a conviction. Uh, in this case, do you think it was a situation where there was just so much public outcry and, and support for the Lindbergh family uh, that they felt compelled to just get a conviction, whether or not it was just uh, or not. Um, but but ultimately, um, do you think that uh, Houtman was not involved in any way? I do. I think that Houtman was framed. If he had been involved, they would have had an easier time framing him okay, for the whole thing. It was clear that more than one person was involved. It mm -hmm. took two and a half years for them to you know, follow up on the investigation. And one of the things that happened was that on the beginning of May 1933, someone turned in $3,000 worth approximately of, um, of of gold certificates that were part of the ransom um, to get them exchanged because that was the last day, I think it was May 1, 33, that FDR um, permitted um, gold certificates to be turned in. After that, it was a misdemeanor to be using them. Um, and that person who signed for it uh, with a apparently fake name um, was, n was not Houtman. The state's handwriting expert said this is somebody else, and they never figured out who that was. There were other indications, um, especially Condon. Condon described um, talking on the phone to someone with another person in the background at when they thought this was a gang, that's what he described. They thought these were members of the gang. And even worse than that, from the pr perspective of trying to make this a lone wolf crime, was the original go-between, um, Curtis, um, who um, preceded Condon. And Curtis um, said that he met with five or six different members of people of the gang that supposedly kidnapped the child. This is before the body was found. Mm -hmm. And he and he was suspicious of this whole thing, so he took a lot of notes, and he described to the police in detail what these people looked like and where they took him. And then Curtis, when the body was found, all of a sudden uh, was accused of obstructing justice. Um, first, he was accused of a hoax, that he wasn't telling the truth. And on the day of his trial, the prosecution switched gears and said, yes, we accept that you're telling the truth. You obstructed justice by not coming forward with these um, people sooner. So maybe that, I don't know, it wouldn't be that the child wouldn't die because they know he died before Curtis was even part of the case, but in catching them. What was very peculiar about that is having made that determination that Curtis was telling the truth, that there were at least five other people five or six people, none of whom were Houtman, um, resembled Houtman, uh, involved, they turn around in 35 and prosecute Houtman as a lone wolf. Wow. I, I'm told that uh, Houtman's son is, is still alive, um, but has never publicly spoken at all about uh, the case. Uh, right. It, it would be interesting to... Uh, see if there was any other information that anyone had. I mean, obviously, as I've already said, it was 90 years ago. No one's um, that was that was a witness is certainly alive. But it would be interesting to see if there was ever any push to to reopen, as you suggest, there could be um, to, uh, to you know to to confirm or deny what what, what occurred. 
Um, well, there, there, it was a, a push. Um, it, it, there's never been a successful push so far. Um, he uh, is different from his mother. She, she dedicated her life to proving uh, her husband innocent. He believed in his, um, in his father's innocence, but he didn't want to be publicly involved in any of the um, uh, what, what happened afterward, especially since his father was vilified as you know public enemy number one. Um, he just has never, I've never spoken with him, but my understanding is that he's never wanted to, to be, um, associated with the reinvestigation. Um, but I had put in my book evidence that shows, uh, very different reasons for what happened to the child. There's other peculiarities that haven't been really explored. One of them is that Lindbergh disseminated, um, a poster. Um, he had the police put up, put together a poster that was uh, ubiquitous all over the United States, places in Europe, whatever, where they were supposedly looking for his son, and just and showed pictures, two pictures of his son at the age of one year, at 29 inches with curly hair. At the time that the child disappeared, he was 33 inches tall pursuant to this pediatric report from his last visit two weeks earlier, and he just had his hair cut the week before he disappeared. I have photos in my book that uh, appeared in uh, a few newspapers. One of the photos is labeled, this is what he looked like when he disappeared, and he was described by um, Lindbergh's lawyer's wife, um, uh, Mrs. Breckenridge, um, as looking... Uh, over two and a half years old. Hmm. So Lindbergh disseminated photos that were totally out of date for people looking for a, a small baby. It wasn't a baby. This kid was a toddler, um, a you know, good-sized toddler, um, and was very active. He he had a vocabulary um, which was uh, probably a little bit advanced for his age. Um, uh, which his mother recorded and the nanny recorded things about, you know, he, he memorized all the animals in his Noah's Ark that he got for Christmas in 31. Um, and he had a, a, a three-wheeler um, in his um, uh, nursery, um, like a little scooter, a wooden scooter. Um, he was not a baby. Uh, and he had an oversized head noted by his pediatrician and other issues that indicated he had some health problems. Hmm. And and yet that wasn't brought forth. And I think you bring that out in well, the book. Well, no, yeah. not only not brought forth at the trial, they ID'd a picture of him at one year. And both uh, Lindbergh and his wife swore that he was in great health, or good health, uh, apart from having a cold. And he was actually on very heavy-duty uh, medicine um, the Osterol, um, which they re told the press when he disappeared, um, vitamin D deficiency. Commonly known as rickets? Well, it could have been rickets. It was a rickety condition, according to his uh, physician, which may have been genetic. And was, uh, my understanding is that rickets is generally um, a vitamin D deficiency in diet. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it was a, back then they just called it a rickety condition. Got it. Well, I, I think we would all agree that our, our system of justice, uh, not just in New Jersey, but in the entire United States, demands a, a fair and impartial trial where all the evidence is brought out. And, you know, certainly our, our as, I, as I began, our court roles have evolved over the years to uh, ensure that um, both sides are able to properly present their case. And if there is uh, certainly... Uh, needs to be fairly and impartially presented by the prosecution, uh, and and we, you know touching upon the the scientific evidence has to be uh, established to be based in uh, in 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 fact, and um, it, and I, I think that's ultimately the most important thing. Your your you published your book uh, in September of two thousand and twenty. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. What what do you what do you think are the next steps? I mean, you you've judge you've presided over a number of cases, uh, you know, in your professional career. Um, you've now devoted a lot of time to uh, researching and writing this particular book. Where 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 are we left? Well, I'm um, trying to gather evidence with the help of experts um, to get uh, Houtman posthumously exonerated. Um, neither theory on which he was convicted is 
correct. And I, if there is a wood DNA test, I think it would show that the two pieces of wood actually did not originate from the same tree, which is what the um, prosecution claimed. But even at the, what's what's bizarre is even if somehow that did, even if there were any reason to believe that he built this rickety ladder, and actually Houtman was most offended. Here he is on trial for his life. He was most offended that someone as excellent at carpentry as he was um, would make a ladder that, um, uh, you know, unable to hold the weight of a grown man, um, let alone a grown man holding a 27 to 30 pound kid. Um, it cracked when the police tried to um, carry a load on it. Um, it was it could only hold about 125 pounds in weight, so that was um, bizarre itself. But the but the uh, evidence is that there was no blood anywhere, and how could they have prosecuted him for those things? Um, apart from as I said, if even if he had somehow built this ladder, that doesn't make him the kidnap murderer. It, it it there's a disconnect there. No one ever saw him at the site of the Lindberghs, and there's no blood to indicate either theory uh, on which the prosecution succeeded in getting him convicted. And you have to recognize that there was a huge public outcry on behalf of their hero. There were something like 10,000 people outside of the um, courthouse yelling, kill Houtman, uh, while the jury deliberated. Uh, it was considered by the ABA uh, just a couple of years later to be one of the worst examples of a miscarriage of justice um, from professional misconduct and improper publicity in the history of the United States. From a legal perspective, uh, are you aware uh, uh, as to whether or not, uh, either in New Jersey or elsewhere, anyone has been uh, acquitted posthumously? And what well, and, and what a, would be the... It's not an acquittal. It's a posthumous pardon by, um, uh, yes, that happens. Okay. So it's a posthumous pardon. And, and how does, how, how does that, uh, how do, how does that happen? Well, you, you go through the attorney general and, uh, and, uh, and the governor. Um, it, in fact, governor Whitman was asked to posthumously pardon Houtman about 25 years ago. Um, and she didn't, consider that the evidence that they were able to provide her uh, was sufficient. She had, she thought it was a troubling prosecution, but she didn't think it was sufficient to do mm -hmm. that at the time. I have since reached out to her, and she had read my book, and she changed her mind. She thought that um, what happened to Houtman was a miscarriage of justice. Uh, now, she thinks that now, and she's trying to help me. Oh, wow, well, okay. And what, what uh, organization or individuals uh, brought that uh, to her attention um, It was previously. brought to her attention by the editor of Houtman's um, uh, autobiography, um, okay. and that is Don Heinrich Tolzman, and, and Houtman had written in German, I am innocent, a statement in the death cell, shortly before he was executed. And uh, Tolzman um, produced an English uh, copy uh, uh, um, recently, I think in 2016. But before that, he had done a lot of research on it. And uh, he had a, a, a sent his materials to the governor um, back in the 90s. Wow, okay. Well, listen, I appreciate you taking the time to join me today to uh, share a little bit about your book, The Lindbergh Kidnapping Suspect Number 1, the man who got away. Uh, you did, in fact, receive the Excellence Award uh, for that, for true crime. Uh, and it, it will be uh, interesting to follow to see uh, if your efforts to have him posthumously pardoned are successful. Well, thank you so much. And I hope that your listeners, if they read it, will um, appreciate that there's a lot of evidence supporting a very different theory of what happened to this child. Judge Perlman, thank you so much. Thank you. That concludes our conversation and this series. Don't forget to subscribe for alerts. You're going to love our upcoming guests. The best way to follow, subscribe, rate, or message the show is to visit njcriminalpodcast.com.
If you're interested in starting a podcast, visit the contact page at njcriminalpodcast.com and send Meg a message. She'd love to discuss your legal podcast 